Oh, I'm good. 
thank God for all He's done this morning. Thank God all the songs, testimonies, all His goodness. You know, uh, again, taking the sacrament service this morning meant so much to me that it become individualized. You know, it's not like I'm among people. I knew that, but it became very personal to me. And I think that's any time that we're in the house of the Lord, even with the Word of God, we preach. It's hard to be individualized. Amen. I, I thank God for corporate worship. That's what we do together. Lift your hands, praise the Lord, shout, and uh, just praise the Lord all we can. But there comes a time in our life when we need to take heed to the Word of God. And the Bible does tell us to take the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we let them slip. Pay attention to what's been preached, lest it gets away from you. If you do not pay attention, if you do not give heed to it, if you do not... Uh, again, desire this, it's going to be hard to obtain what God wants you to have. How many remember going to school and you have a class maybe an hour long and the teacher teaches you? And he teaches and he talks and he does diagrams or whatever. And at the end of that hour, you're saying, Wow, what did he say? What did he do? Now, that simply means that you were daydreaming. Or you could care less what he was saying. And then it comes testing time and we freak out because we say, man, I should have paid attention. Because what he told me was going to be on the test. Well, folks, that's the same way as the Word of God. If you don't pay attention, you do not know how to come through this test. Come on now. The Word of God gives us the answer, again, to the test. Tells you how to do it. What to do when you go through something. How to handle things. How to pray. How to fast, how to read your Bible, how to have faith. All that's in the manual. But yes, sometimes we'd rather watch rerun TV or the Reader's Digest and lay the Bible down. Yeah. On, so I, that's, not, that's not my message, by the way. I'm just trying to tell you, pay attention. Look at somebody right now and say, wake up, pay attention. Wake up, pay attention. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, please turn with me, if you would, to St. Luke chapter 5. <coughs> St. Luke chapter 5, let me begin reading verse 27. Kind of had a thought on my mind this week is why God sent His Son to the world. That's kind of where I want to preach this morning. Why did God send His Son to the world? But I want to read a few verses here before I get into that. In St. Luke chapter 5, begin reading verse 27. When you got to say, I got it. St. Luke 5, 27. And again, look what, look what uh, Luke is saying. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi. Now the word Levi, you know who Levi was? Levi was Matthew. Levi, his name is Matthew, would write the book of Matthew. So here's what Levi was doing before he got saved. And Jesus went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. Now Levi was a publican, but he was also a tax collector. It wasn't, what, what they, they, were, they were crooked people. If you owe, say, a hundred dollars in taxes, he was sent to get that. But he would tell you, you owe two hundred. In other words, he would get the hundred and keep a hundred. That's how bad they were. Does that sound like anything today? Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> so Levi was called of the Lord. Here, here he was, a very bad person. But the Lord called him. Again, Levi would be Matthew. Now look what he did in verse 28. And he left all and rose up and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. Now, I want you to catch that. Levi was a tax collector, a dirty, dirty job, began to follow Jesus, and now he said, hey, come to my house. We're going to have a feast. Who did he invite? Other publicans. I know it's other crooked men. Something had to happen to Levi that he would say, you need to hear this man. You need to know this man. I'm going to throw a feast and I'm about you to be with him. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. 
Look at verse 30. But the scribes and Pharisees, bless the little heart, yeah. murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Boy, we'd have a ball time. We'd have a ball today. I know there are some sinners that I go to a restaurant and cook my food. Yeah. Now, all your sinners cook my food, but I sat down amongst them as well, ate my food. Yeah. I mean, the scribes and Pharisees would have a hard time with that one. Look here at verse 31. And Jesus answered and said unto them, said to, again, the scribes and Pharisees, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Yeah. Yeah. And I came not to call the righteousness, but sinners to repentance. Amen. Now what Jesus is saying here, again, he he knew what he was doing, hanging around sinner people, not to partake of their evil do, de deeds, but he hung around them as an example and a light to them. So when he came to this earth, he was on a mission. Right. We know that. Because of the fall of mankind, because of Adam and Eve, had came over to satanic forces and ate of the tree of good and knowledge, sin came in. In other words, they gave over to Satan, and when they did, Satan began to rule and bring sin in the lives of mankind. So we find this again, that Jesus and God knew that sin became rapid, rapid upon the earth. There would be a time that God would say, I repent that I ever made men. Why? Because they were so corrupt and they were so evil, and their mind was continually, the Bible said, all evil. Now God and Jesus of heaven had watching everything down here. They, he, they knew what was going on. They knew the sin was rampant. They, they, they knew that. They, they knew there was a problem. They knew people were sick. And I'm telling you right now, people go to a doctor or not to a hospital to take care of their physical body. They want to be well physically. I don't care how long you live. I don't care how well you feel. You are going to die physically. But yet we neglect the very thing that will live for eternity, and that would be our soul. Amen. And the soul of mankind that does not know Jesus are sick people. Yeah. I've seen many buff men in my lifetime that would lift weights. I went to school with some of them. I was in college with some of them. Only for them to come down with some kind of a sickness and to window their way to nothing. All the muscles were gone. All the good looks were gone. All the strength was gone. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying they did not need a doctor at that time. They needed the great physician. That somebody say amen. To walk into that room and make a difference in their life. But Jesus was saying, look what he said here again in verse 31. They that are whole need not a physician. But they that are sick. He's not talking about the body at this time. He's talking about the soul. People are sin sick. Verse 32 says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinner to repentance. Look at verse 32. He came. Everybody say, he came. Yeah. He came to call, who? The sinner to repentance. Now, when you think about what is happening in this world today, that many people think they do not need anything but a doctor, a lawyer, and their money. And they all, they're all the same. It's, it's, it's thieves. I think I told you once before that man was dying. He was just hours away from death. And he told his wife, he said, I want my banker and I want my lawyer to show up. I need them by my bedside. So the banker and the lawyer come up, sat by the bedside, this man dying. And the banker and the lawyer looked at each other because they wasn't real good friends of his. And they begin to wonder, why does he want us to sit by his bedside while he's dying? So finally, the lawyer spoke up and said, can you tell us why we're sitting by your bedside? He said, well, Jesus died between two thieves. <laughs> and I think I'm no different. Wow. So we understand that many people today are sick. They are sin sick, and they need a Savior. Yeah. They need a great physician. Can someone say Amen. But Jesus came because the fall of man was so great on the earth that they could not help themselves. And I know people today will walk around saying, I am my old man. 
Do you know you're saying, I do my own thing, I do my own ways, and no one can stop it? Can I tell you again, there's going to come a day in your life, you wish you went God's way. Can someone say amen to that? We find out Jesus did come to this earth. He was on a mission to save souls. That was his mission, to see souls saved. And if you do not give in to the Lord when the knock is up on the door, because the Bible said that today is the day of salvation. What day is that? That's the day that God knocks at your heart door. That is your day of salvation. Jesus came on this earth. Somebody said, yeah, but he went back to the Heavenly Father. Yes, he did. But he came here and died on the cross for the sins of all mankind. And then he left his disciples and ministers of the gospel to continue on the work that he started. And we're still saying the very same thing that Jesus did. You must be born again. Come on. I said, you must be born again. There's no option here. You must be born again if you want to make heaven your home. Everyone that does not know Jesus today is sin sick. And yet we take vitamins. <clears throat> we pump hard. We run. We, we, we're built great in stature. But inside we're a skinny million. Because mm -hmm. we do not have Jesus. What builds your soul and your faith is Jesus dying for you. If we're not careful, we'll discount that so much in our life that we think we do not need anyone. But I'm telling you, the fall of man came through Adam and Eve. Look here in Romans 5, 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. Death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for all had sinned. There is no way around this. When you are born on the face of the earth, when you start breathing air on the face of the earth, you are marked with sin. Can someone say amen? And you need another physician. I know the physician may deliver you, and the physician may take care of you as a baby, but I know a greater one than that, and that greater one is a man called Jesus that died on Mount Calvary. Amen. As your soul can be healed. Sin came by one man. Sin entered in by one man. Death by one man. Death passed upon all men. They have all sinned. Romans 3.23 said, For all have sinned. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jesus came because a man had fell, fallen. They fell into sin. And there's nothing they could do about it within themselves. They needed a redeemer. They, they needed a salvation. They, they needed a God who can. Can someone say amen? And I'm going to tell you, we just took the Lord's Supper. But I'll say this again this morning. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. We don't need goats and bull lives. We don't need the high priest. We don't need the holies of holies anymore. Amen. Because if Jesus died on Mount Calvary, we now have access to the Heavenly Father. I can get on my knees before God and say, Lord, save my soul. I don't need a priest to lay a hand on me. I don't need a preacher to lay a hand on me. I need the Holy Ghost to get a hold of me. I need the Holy Ghost to convict me. And I need the Holy Ghost to let me know that I am on my way to hell. Come on, somebody say praise the Lord. We need Jesus. The great physician is in the room. Somebody say, I don't like going to doctors. They have to make you wait. The great physician is here today. Sometimes it'll make you wait. So you get what you need from God but to build your faith. But I'm telling you right now, he's in the room. Yeah. He's watching you. He's looking over you. Man needed a Savior. Again, look what we need to be saved for. We need to be saved from ourselves, saved from our sins, saved from this world. John 3, 17 tells us, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. Jesus came on a mission of love. Oh, I, I know that he got angry and overturned the, temp, the, the, the table in the temple because they were making merchandise of it. Right. Yeah, he had he rides in indignation. Right. But at the same time, he's a God of so much love. You find this love he has in, in his life today. Let you and I know that we need him. Yeah. He didn't come to condemn me. I know I'm already condemned. How many of you know when you're wrong? Yeah. And you know when you're right. Amen. The Holy Ghost condemns you. He's not there pointing fingers at you. He said, hey, I'm on my way to get you. I'm on my way to help you. You need a Savior. You need a physician to heal your soul. It's amazing to me. How I've watched a lot of these crackpots on TV. A lot of these so-called preachers. 
I think I told you here a while back, there's one called soaking. I was this preacher talking about soaking, so I stayed tuned. I would advise you to stay tuned to anything that you could get caught up in. But I knew I was established enough in the Lord that it was not going to face me. It's called soaking in the Spirit. Wow. Oh, that sounds pretty good. I just laid there and should take it all in. Yeah. <laughs> and what they were saying is you go into a room, put on I said, hey, some music, and you just sit there and oh, oh, oh. soaking in the Spirit. I watched that for a while. I'm thinking, hmm. If, if I remember right, the night I got saved, I was baptized into the blood of Jesus. Watch and wash away my sins. Nothing but the blood. I had already been soaked. I've already been dipped in that blood. I don't need to stand there at home. I don't need to sit on the floor with my legs crossed. I don't need to put my fingers in the air and hum a song. What I need to do is get up, begin to sing a song from my heart, and begin to realize I'm a walking in Jesus. I'm a soaked in the blood. Come on now. I tell you, I know who my Redeemer is. He was my great physician. I was sin sick, and I needed a healing for my soul. And he came into my life and took it all away. Woo, glory be to God. They would tell you 21 days of fasting would give you everything you want. That's not true. Right. Well, I, I, I've read about Daniel's 21 day of fasting. I, I get that. I heard that when he prayed that God heard it the first time. He was fighting a battle. I get that. Yeah. I heard that many things that people tell you that if you sit in a certain pew a certain way, God's going to bless you a certain way. Let me tell you right now. If we do not get back to Bible believing oh, wow. and begin to realize that Jesus came to save me, not the preacher, not this world, not people around me. I read my Bible and I found that in the book, in the back of the book. We all win if we give our heart to the Lord and let that great physician heal us from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. Amen. Because we need a Savior. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. I don't know how you feel, but I believe the world needs to hear. They're on the way to hell, but we have a remedy. His name is called Jesus. The blood of Jesus can wash away all your sins. Mm. He, he loves us. Yes. 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 The physicians in the room, you want to hear the gospel in a nutshell, John 3, 16, but God so loved the world. Amen. Then he gave it only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth upon him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, let me stop here. Right. Yesterday afternoon, I, I came into an article. I was doing my research, I was on my computer, looking at some commentaries. They take this one verse right here and say, God says right here, He does not want anyone to be lost. Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but every left in every life. God is not slack, the Bible said, concerning His promises, as some men count for slackness. But as long suffered to us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Now, they use that verse. Here's here, here, here what I want to bring you up. They're saying, there's no possible way, once you are saved, that you'll ever go to hell. Matter of fact, they took it one step, and I, I heard a man say, I, I wasn't on YouTube. What he said, everybody that's here, saved or lost, is going to heaven. And here what he was saying, because God don't want anyone to perish. So if God don't want anyone to perish, he has us taken care of. Where do you get that nonsense? Right, right. He said he's not willing that any should perish. He don't want that to happen. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believeth upon him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Folks, it's about you having faith in God. You, boy, that I, I cannot believe the doctrine out there today. And yet they tell you and I, if you listen to them, that you're all right, I'm all right, the world's all right, we're all right. Kind of sound like what the left says. <laughs> I believe this morning that if you do not understand the scripture, 
He came to seek and to save them which was lost. He did not come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But you've got to believe the, the gospel. You've got to believe that Jesus came and died on my Calvary for the sins of all my mankind. If that be the case, if God wanted everybody to be saved, all God had to say was, it's not my will, you perish. We're done. But he sent his son to pay the price for the sins of all mankind. Jesus came because men had fell. He came because they needed a Savior. He came because of his love. For God so loved the world. He also came to give us a choice where to spend eternity. If I stood before you this morning and I give you two doors. The doors are closed. One says eternity of peace, joy, happiness, bliss. Could go on. One says to burn in a lake of fire for eternity. If you actually seen that, and I said, now make it your choice. Right? right. right? Isn't that what this is about? Amen. Isn't it about making a choice? Yes. When you think about this, Jesus came to give us the option. Right. Yeah. You have Satan on this side, you have God on this side. Even the children of Israel, the book of Deuteronomy, Joshua would tell them, choose you this day whom you will serve, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Also, he said, behold, I set before you this day death and life. But he said, choose life. The option is always there. Jesus came to give us the option where we spend eternity. Look what it said right here. In Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What's he saying? You stay in your sins, death. Right. You get saved in my blood, you have eternal life through Christ Jesus. Yes. Now you know eternity is real. Eternity is no, it's never ending. It's a night. It will go on forever. So everywhere, anywhere you choose to spend eternity is where you're going to be for the rest of your life. Jesus came to say this. I tore down the veil of the temple. Now you have access to my heavenly Father. I sat at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for you. Whatever you need me to do, I can do that for you. As long as you stay in line with the Word of God, I came to save you. I came to deliver you. I paid the price on my Calvary. I came on this earth because you are again sin sick. Right. And now I give you a choice. If you want the wages of death, keep sinning. Right. You want the gift of God, get saved. So again, he gave us a choice. But Jesus came. Not only did he come to do that, he came to give us, a, 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 again, a, a Savior and love. And he came to give us a, a choice of eternity. He also came to give us a better life. This is something I kind of want to look at for just a moment here. Too many bitter people in this world today. I'm talking to Christians. I, we, we know what the world is. They're bitter. Bitter, 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 bitter. I haven't found it yet, but I think there might be a cereal out there called the cereal of bitter. No milk needed. Eat it like it is. People are bitter. And yet they say they're saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. People are complainers. They are murmurers. They're backbiters. They're tattletales. Can I, can I kill you or something? Thank you, I think you will. Do you think when people, you tell people things that they keep it to themselves? No. I want you to look at me. You might be amazed what I know that you think I don't know Boy, from your best friend. From your BFF yes. to the one that said, I won't tell nobody. Yeah. Off to the pastor. Oh, I must be the nobody. <laughs> Why am I saying that? It's because Christians are having a bitter life. Right. Rather than focusing their life in God and focusing to God and serving God the way they ought to serve the Lord, 
They let sin come in, get a hold of them, and next thing you know, they start saying stuff to other people. I've always said, if you want to know something about Larry Baker, who should you talk to? Larry Baker. Larry Baker. Is that whole true? Yeah. Do people, people do that? No, because no? sometimes when I get it forth, forth, forth down the line, I, get, I hear that. <laughs> and by the time it's forth down the line, whew, you won't believe what I did. <laughs> I've been talking to people, repeat, 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 man, I, I'm going to jail. <laughs> That's about what that's done. Your life shouldn't be that bitter that you have to carry around so much hatred, so much envy, so much strife. I mean, again, the Bible said that vengeance is his. He said, I will repay, saith the Lord. If you want to have a happy life, you ought to be able, amen, to put your life in the Lord and say, I cast it on God. Let God take care of it. The reason I'm saying that is John 10.10. 10. Why, why did Jesus come? John 10.10 10 tell us the thief came to kill, to steal, and to destroy. What did Jesus say? I came that you might have, that you might have. I know some of you look back there and say, boy, you call this living. Mm -hmm. Jesus came that you might have life. Stop, stop, stop just a minute. If he just came to give me life, I would be, I'm still happy. Yeah. I want life. Amen. Because in my sins, I was dead. Right. Some of you thought you were kicking up your heels in, in your sin. No, you weren't. Right. You were just making it more misery after miserable. You are just miserable people. Yeah. Once you know Jesus, he gave you life. But he didn't stop just saying, I give you life. He said, I came that you might have life. And have it more abundantly. The word abundantly means more than enough. We ought to be again the happiest people on the face of the earth because Jesus came and delivered us from our sin, wrote our name down in the land book of life. He gave us peace. He gave us joy. He gave us happiness. He gave us a home in heaven. We ought to be better. We ought to be happier. Amen. Ooh, glory. He came to give me a better life. He came. To save my soul. He came as my Savior. He came because He loved me. He came to change where I spent eternity. Right. He came to give me a better life. Yes. I want you to look at somebody and I want you to hear what they say to you. I want you to tell them I've got a better life. You that hear that, I want you to hear the tone. Turn around right now and tell somebody, I got a better life. <laughs> <laughs> you just told somebody you had you had a better life. Yeah. I was. I can hear some of you saying, "I got a better life." <laughs> Did you say bitter? Better, bitter? It's up to you and I to receive what Jesus gave us. Right. I came that you might have life. See the word came means Jesus came. Right. That's why he came. Right. He came again to give us life and to give us life more abundantly. Now we all have bad days. That's why you take the position with you. I don't know about you, but I'm better than Hollywood. They have their guards around them. Yeah. They have physicians in their house. I've got one that sleeps with me, rides with me, talks with me, walks with me, eats with me. Everything I do, my physician's there. All I got to do is say, hey, Jesus, I got a problem here. And the physician, the, the physician shows right there. Right up. There he is to take care of me. I want to be happy. Now again, remember back in the Old Testament when the forgiveness of sin was done once a year. Yeah. They would go into the holies of holies and they, and, they, and, they would, and they would make an atonement for the sins of all the people and they would take a, a, a goat, a bullock or something and kill it on the altar. And what happened when they killed on the altar, God had to receive that sacrifice, the blood offering, if you will. And that was done once a year. And that was done under the law, the old covenant. Right, right. The old law covenant said once a year, the sins had to be forgiven. Right. 
Here it is, 365 day period. Now we're offering the offering of our sin. Now day one starts all over at the 365. What do you think happened on day one? More sin. Say more, say more, say more. What, what they were forgiven for just 24 hours ago, they're back doing the same thing. Then they can do the same thing for 365 days. That's 365 days. The priest goes back in, offer sin again, boom, they're gone. Go for that second, and they go back and do it again. That was the only covenant. But Jesus came to give us a better covenant. You got to hear this. One of the, again, when, when, the, when the veil was written in the temple, when he hung on the cross and said, that's finished, the veil read. That veil, again, behind there was a holy of holies. Right. And that veil was torn in two. Yeah. And they said it could not be torn in two by anybody. It was so thick, so heavy. It was torn in two to where we could get through the veil. And what's on the other side of the veil is nothing but God. Come on, can someone say amen? <laughs> the new covenant said, no longer do you need a sacrifice. I am your sacrifice. The new covenant simply said, you don't need it again for, for an animal to be sacrificed for the blood. I am the blood. I made a way for you. I am the new covenant. No longer do you need to go to a priest. No longer do you need, again, wait for a year to be forgiven. You can get on your knees any day of the week and then cry out to the Heavenly Father. We have Jesus at the right hand of our Father to make intercession for us. Hmm. Hebrews 8, 6 tells us, but now hath he, speaking about Jesus, obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also he is the mediator of our better covenant, which was established upon better promise. You know what the covenant is? An agreement. Yeah. Jesus didn't say, you, here's the agreement. You come to me, I'll forgive your sins, and we're in agreement together. Right. That's our covenant. Now, I can go to my father. We're back in the Old Testament. They could not. Matter of fact, the priests would go into the Holy of Holies and what they would do is they had a tunic on and had bells around the bottom and a rope. And as long as they were walking around here in the bells, uh, they knew they lived. See, some of the priests could go in, they'd be struck dead because they wasn't right with God. But if they happened to die, no one could go in after them. Because they were all sinners. And they would take the rope, when the bell stopped, the rope was hanging out, then pull the rope and drag him out of there. Aren't you glad we have a new covenant today? Aren't you glad I can get on my knees and you can get on your knees and say, Father, I come to you now in the name of Jesus. Jesus at the right hand of the Father. I come in the name of Jesus, the one that died on my time, the one that gave me a better covenant, the one that gave me a life worth living. Amen. The one again that loved me so much that he hung on my time. I come to you. He came to save me. I'm your child. I, your, my name is written down. Mm. You know, we, 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 we think about this so much, but sometimes we forget. We have access. We have a better covenant now. We right now can pray for our stuff. Yes. We can go to God for our stuff. Yes. And we can talk to the Father. See, the Father says there, yes. Jesus at the right hand. Right. When you pray in the name of Jesus, Jesus said, that's your Father. Father, that's your son or daughter praying. Jesus is our mediator. Right. He turns to the Father. Right. He says, Father, that's your son and that's your daughter, and they're asking for a healing. They're asking for a miracle. That is your child. He's like a lawyer sent there on our behalf. Right. Yeah. Now, some of us think we're too bad to receive from the Lord. But Jesus says the blood's there. Yeah. And because the blood is there, he goes to our defense. And the Father said, because Jesus, you died for them, and they served me, I will give it to them. Right. That's how that works, folks. Right. Aren't you glad we are speaking turn with our Heavenly Father? Amen. Aren't you glad you're speaking terms with that one that created this world? He came again to seek and to save that which was lost. He never came to condemn us. He comes to save us. And still real today. I, I, I don't know what you go through. I don't know if you're saved or lost here this morning. But one thing I do know, there's not 50 ways to heaven. There's not 100 ways to heaven. There's not even two ways to heaven. There's not even one and a half way to heaven. You'll never get to heaven unless you come through the cross. Can somebody say amen? You've got to be born again. 
and you got to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and that's it. Amen. Shame on anybody on TV. One preacher was asking about homosexuality. And as they, of course, they want to ask, what do you think about homosexuality? Don't you preach against that? Here was his answer. Well, I don't think it's God's best way. How can you say it's not God's best way when it's not God's way at all? Yeah. If you have doubts about what I'm telling you, go home, please, and read Romans chapter 1. That's right. And then when you reach Romans chapter 1, read it again. Yeah. And then when you read Romans chapter 1, read it again. Yeah. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. That's not what God's way is. But for people to join a church, to have a big church, to be able to have a crowd and the money coming in, they saw for the blow and things like that. Can someone say amen? And in other words, they're preaching ungodly doctrine and they're trying to get people to heaven on other terms. I'm going to tell you, there's only one door, and that door is Jesus Christ to the sheepfold. Can someone say amen? He is the door to the sheepfold. If he don't come through the door, if, if the Bible even said, if any man comes up any other way, he's the same as a thief and a robber. Jesus is the door. When you folks came in here this morning, how did you get in here? If you say through the window, I'm going to get you. <laughs> the door is called the entrance, not the window. The door is the way in. Jesus Christ is the way in. When you come to him, he is the door to salvation. He is the door to heaven. He is the door to your miracle. He is the door to your blessings. You must come through Jesus Christ. If you hear anyone else teach any other thing than that, get away from them. Cut the TV off. And I want to tell you something. Be very careful when you're scrolling your YouTube or your TVs. Now, I know people don't like this kind of preaching because they want to condone different ways of getting there. Right? Jesus drank wine. Jesus did this. Jesus got angry. Jesus is like us. Be very careful with that. Because he's not like us. And when he did something, he did it with purpose. He did it by the leadership of the Holy Ghost. So today we are sin sick. And we have a great physician called Jesus that can heal you. Amen? And I thank God. I've been in the, been in the hospital. And people were dying and leaving this world. The doctors around them, they would not even say. Been able to pray for them. And they gave their heart to God. You know why? Because the other physical physician had to step back. And the great physician walked in the room. Come on. He had everything that man needed. Jesus came because of the fall of man. He came because we need the Savior. He came because of the love of God. He, he came again to help us determine where we're speed eternity. He came to give us a better life. He came to give us a better covenant. We now have access to our Father. And I'm going to say this to all of us. He is coming again. When he left this world, after 40 days after his resurrection, he would lead his disciples out to a hillside. And Jesus would ascend into the heaven. And the angels stood around about and looked at his men and said, Why do you men of Galilee gaze into the heavens? For the same Jesus that went away will come back, appear in the same manner. He will appear in this. In other words, he went up, he's coming back. And we believe in the rapture here that someday the dead of Christ are going to rise and we that are alive and remain shall be changed in a moment in the twinkle of life. The church will get out of here. He's coming again. Amen. He came to save us, to take us home. Amen. Wow. Wouldn't it be awesome for someone to give you keys to the kingdom? Right. Somebody walk in here today and say, hey, you've had enough in this world. I'm giving you keys to the kingdom. Yeah. And I'm telling you right now, that's what he's going to do on these days. Yeah, it's going to be soon. Please stand here, people. We're going to pray this morning. Don't know what you need from the Lord. Don't know what you're going through. But I know one thing. God is a big God. The great physician is here. You need to be saved. You need to be helped. You need an answer. The physician is here. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Again, he never came to condemn you. How many knows again? we got people that can do that. But that's not what God does. Amen. God don't condemn you. He convicts you. Amen. And today I'm going to ask us all to gather around the altar and let's seek the face of Almighty God. Let's all pray if you will. <laughs> all right, Satan's with me. You ready? It's been good.